living life in the fast lane. I had downers and others pain with the pain. Are you aware that the monthly teaching on my Christian teaching playlist is played by eight pastors all over the world to their congregations and Bible schools? This month's teaching is by my friend, Pastor Andy, from the Rain Network. Every decision we make has consequences, either for good, May God bless you and your congregation in a mighty way as you learn this month.
nice to see you. Come on in. We uh, have a little service. You're welcome to join, or you just go ahead and shop and do your thing. And when you check out, you come to this side here to check out. It's you and you and this is fun. other guy came and he he looked at his beautiful garden he says you know this is so beautiful God has blessed you in so many ways look what everything God has done for you look at those beautiful plants over there and look at the tomatoes and look at the the beans it is amazing no weeds at all and uh, he kept on going saying that God was doing this and he said you know you should have seen this garden when it was just God taking care of you. Okay. See, God has given us responsibility too. And he's told us to manage the gardens of this world. And so uh, a lot of people think, well, like Jim said, let go and let God. No, we need to say, God, how do I cooperate with you in life? How do I pursue you? And how do I listen to you? And and walk in your ways. I always ask God for divine appointments. You know what a divine appointment is? That's when you, when somebody runs across your path and you know God has brought them, just like you shared that story earlier. My my word is godsidence, but here's my unique word for that. Jim's gonna steal it now. It's called deja vu. You know what deja vu is? It's when you, you feel like you've been there before, but deja vu is when God brings something that you know it's only God. Okay. Isn't that awesome how God yeah, does that? that's awesome. Well, last night, my daughter, who's real sensitive to the Holy Spirit, uh, she's a dancer as well. I, they call me the dancing pastor. My daughter last night, she felt led to go to somebody at the camp. She says, uh, can I pray for you? And prays for her. He said, the Lord told me to say something about your wrist. And this girl goes, What? How did you know? And she pulls up her wrist, and I'm guessing she has a scar from maybe uh, trying to commit suicide or something. And, uh, anyway, she was just shocked. How did you know this? Nobody could know this. And my daughter says, because God wants you to know that he loves you. Wow. See, we can be sensitive to that all the time. 
What is the Holy Spirit saying? How is he saying it? You know, that's important. And sometimes we think that we're not important, you know, like when you're helping people out here. But every once in a while, someone will come to the counter. And I'm sure Jim would be okay with this. And maybe you see that they're down or that, that they just, you, something is on them that shouldn't be on them. And you say, you know, um, is, is everything okay? Can I pray for you? And I've noticed that if I ask people to pray for them, boy, I would say 95% say, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. And then when you pray for them, you, you grab their hand like Eric here. You just do it. Yeah. <laughs> and so, Lord, we just thank you for Eric. We thank you for your hand upon his life, Lord. We thank you that you've rescued him from all of his troubles. He had a troubled life in the past. But Lord, you rescued him from all his troubles and you set his feet upon a rock and now he knows the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Why? Because you set him aside for your own purposes. And Lord, now he's able to minister to those that are hurting and those that have gone through troubles themselves. I thank you, Lord, for his gift of deliverance and his gift that he speaks into people's lives so that they can be set free too in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I didn't just pray for Eric. I said, Lord, what is it about Eric that he needs to know? Okay, that's called the word of knowledge. 1 Corinthians 13. Okay, and 14 says this. 1426 is one of my favorite verses to pray. That the secrets of their heart would be revealed and they would fall on their face and say, surely God is in this place. You know, so... When God speaks through us to somebody, it's a confirmation to them that God is real. See, people need to know that God is real. They're, they've been so twisted in their thinking. Who would have imagined that men would think that they're women or women would think that they're men, you know? This testimony you gave about your daughter, by the way, I was alerted to that girl who got ministered to and I saw that the other day. Awesome. Oh, Just a confirmation. Yeah. She was she touched. No, she okay. was touched. Try something. You can be who you are and God can use you mm. to speak through you. God can speak to you and minister to somebody else. Don't ever be discouraged about what God has uh, called you to do. Okay, I want us to turn in Scripture here in Matthew chapter 21. I'm going to share some highlights from Jesus walking into Jerusalem. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord has need of them and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. That's in Zechariah 9, verse 9. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them, and a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out saying, and we know this phrase, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved saying, who is this? So the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Okay, so I want to stop there a moment. But they began to praise him, saying, Hosanna. I looked this up in, in, in Hebrew because this is a scripture from Psalm 118, verse 25 and 26. Okay, so uh, the word is in Hebrew, Hosiana. Hosiana. It's only found in that verse in all of the Bible. Okay? Hosiana. So they took a verse, one verse, and began to proclaim it as Jesus was coming through town. And Hosiana means this it means, Save us, we pray. Save us. So they were yelling, Save us. Save us. 
And many of them might have said, you know, might have been thinking, save us from the Romans. But you know, the name Jesus means Savior, okay? So he came to save and seek and save that which was lost. Okay, so they're saying, save us. Here's another interesting thing. If you look at Psalms 118, verse 25 and 26, it says, save, save us now, or Hoshiana, and give us success. That one isn't repeated here in the New Testament. They just say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But I've been praying that verse. Because Lord, would you save us? And would you grant us, the, some translations say, prosperity. Okay? So Lord, would you save us and grant us prosperity? So I'm going to do something right now. I'm going to pray over this business. God has blessed, obviously blessed you. But Lord, that would even be more blessings. Father, we thank you. Hoshiana, we pray over this business. And grant them success. And Lord God, to Jim and his marriage and his future children, we pray, grant him success. We thank you, Lord God, and may it happen indeed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. So here's the second part of this. Uh, chapter it says when Jesus after he goes into Jerusalem they're saying save us immediately goes into the temple of God verse 12 and he drives out or drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves and he said to them it is written my house shall be called a house of prayer but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children cried out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants you have perfected Praise. Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and he lodged there. Okay, here's what I want you to understand today. Uh, Jesus, I'm going to give you some kind of indirect things that Jesus did. And I'm going to give you some direct things. And he says he had a zeal. The first one is that he was passionate. Jesus was passionate about the temple of God. And we need to start to get passionate about God in his presence because the temple represented where God was his holy presence the Shekinah glory of God and we need to get passionate about God in his presence yeah. can you all say passion, passion. yeah passionate I mean a hundred percent not just 50 not just 60 but passionate for God and being with him in his presence and he, it says that he was passionate why was it? It says, zeal for your house has consumed me. He was so passionate that he was angry that people were doing things that didn't belong in the temple. Okay, so now let's take that a little further. Where is the temple of God today? Yeah, in Corinthians it says that we are the temple of God. In other words, the Holy Spirit, the Shekinah glory of God resides in a believing person okay so are we going to be passionate for the presence of God inside of us and are we going to be so passionate that we drive out the things that don't belong in the holy temple of God so the first one is passion but the presence of God is what belong there in the temple the presence of God is what belongs in our lives it, David said it this way take not thy Holy Spirit from me okay in other words he didn't want to lose that sense of God's presence in his life and sometimes we're not sensitive and we lose the presence of God because we're acting in ways that we should be acting and we're doing things that we should be doing and like uh, last night, uh, the message last night, we, we, we become a stagnant lake like the Dead Sea. Mm. We're never given out. We're only taken in. Mm. We need to be given out as well as taken in. 
And uh, God wants us sensitive to that presence. Let's talk a little bit about the presence of God in the Old Testament. They had the Ark of God, and the Shekinah glory dwelt in the Holy of Holies. And David was so passionate for this that he said, I need to get that Ark back to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. It needs to be here. Because it has rested in a place called Obadiah's house for a period of years. And Obadiah just was kind of kind because they tried to take the presence of God and they messed up. They carried it the wrong way and somebody died. Okay, mm -hmm. so they let it stay at Obadiah's house and in the process, it says God blessed everything that Obadiah had. He blessed his house, he blessed his kids, he blessed his family, he blessed his business. Everything was being blessed. And the word gets back to David and he says, David, I don't know, but that guy Obadiah, he's being blessed in everything. David said, God, this can't just happen to him. We need it in Jerusalem. We need it near the king's house. We need it here in the capital. And so let's do whatever it takes to get the presence of God back to us. Okay. So my question for all of us is, how many of us, want the presence of God that bad. We want God's presence in our life that bad that we'll do whatever it takes to get it back, to have it. Well, I've got good news. If you've asked Jesus into your life, the presence of God is in you. The question is, have you let it saturate all the way through? And have you been sensitive to the presence or is he subdued, okay? There's times when the Ark of the Covenant was in Jerusalem but it didn't affect them hardly at all because they didn't honor God. Hmm. But when they began to honor God, began to worship and to praise, okay, David set up a tabernacle of David, it was called. They just had 24 hours of praise and worship around the clock, <laughs> and God's hmm. presence was there. And it says, in the last days, I'm going to set up the tabernacle of David again. Okay, I don't think it's necessarily a literal thing. I think it's that God wants worship and praise to go out throughout the, all the earth. Mm. So all the nations can come to Him. So the presence of God, something that isn't directly said here about the temple, but it's definitely known that this is what the temple was about. So Lord, we just pray that the presence of God would be stronger in our life than ever before. We pray that you'd minister to us, minister through us, and Lord God, that your presence would be strong in Jesus' name. Okay. Also, it says he drove out the money changers. Okay. So they were doing some things in the temple of God that they shouldn't have been doing. They were trying to make money. They were merchandising the temple versus making it the place that God wanted it to be. And so he says he drove out the money changers. Uh, to me, here's another P word, purity. When we are the temple of God, that means we live pure lives. In Corinthians, it says we're the temple of God. And he uses it, the illustration of then that we don't hook ourselves up with things that are fleshly or ungodly. And we don't do ungodly things because that messes with the presence of God in our life. So if we're the temple, we'll be pure. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. God wants us to be pure, okay? That's an indirect one again that, that was stated. So passion, his presence, his purity. But now let's talk about the ones that are direct, okay? He says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Okay, so if this is the temple of God, guess what this temple does? It prays. It seeks after God. That means the priority of this temple is to pursue the presence of God and to pray for God's will to be done in people's lives. Okay? I, I remember with John Wesley, I grew up Methodist, so I like John Wesley a lot, although the Methodists have departed a lot from their original passion, okay? Uh, but John Wesley says, God does nothing 
but an answer to believing prayer. Okay? So if there is, it's, it's kind of like this way. God is looking, he's given us authority, we're his children. But if there's somebody on the earth that will believe me for things to change, I'm ready to come down and help them out. I'm ready to answer their prayer. How many are willing to pray for something that that somebody needs in their life or for a change in their family? Uh, here's just a testimony. I was the first one saved in our family. We grew up Methodist, but it was all just kind of go to church sort of thing, traditional. But when God changed my life after my brother died, it changed the dynamic of the whole family. It took a while. I was discouraged. I remember buying... Uh, a rental up at Bible camp for my mom and dad because they were going to go through a divorce. So I wanted to save it and I wanted them to be saved. And they still went through the divorce. We went through all that. But over a period of time, because I honored God and I was faithful to my call, my mom and dad got saved. They were baptized. And my uh, sister and her whole family knows the Lord. My brother, who was an alcoholic for 30 some years I was his pastor I was his brother and I was his landlord and he was drinking he got caught drinking again and he had a DUI and I said uh, I said Lord he was going to go to jail for 90 days I said Lord what do I do I said I, I, I'm his landlord he owes me a lot of money I want to kick him out I'm tired of this drinking you know kind of like tough love right and the Lord spoke to me, and this is what my mom always did. And I always was troubled by it. My mom would always, because moms are that way. Oh, don't worry about it. We love them no matter what. You know, it's kind of like soft love, right? But I want a tough love. Get him out of that apartment. Get my money back if I can. Da, 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 da. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, let pastor win. Oh, really? So... I let Pastor win, and thank God for that, because I love my brother despite his stupidity, okay? And I was tired of the drinking, but after 90 days, he got out of that. After 30 years of being an alcoholic, he never took a drink again. Wow, God. He went through our Bible school. He's been on the mission field, and he loves the Lord. He's still, he's still a crazy brother, but... Uh, he is, uh, now this has been about 15 years since he drank. Isn't that something? Yeah. Yeah, I have another friend, uh, my classmate from school. His name's Dean. And Dean uh, lived a, a trans life, a gay lifestyle. He was an alcoholic, a drug addict. I mean, he, if there was problems, he had it. Yeah. Okay? He lived that kind of life, and then he... Uh, kind of briefly visited our church and was touched a little bit, but then he'd go drinking and he had the alcohol problem. So we sent him up to Minneapolis to uh, Salvation Army. They have a rehab program. He went through it, but when he got out, he started drinking again. But we loved him through it. We sent him up there again another six months. Now after that, he, got, he was free totally. He is one of my... Uh, closest friends. He's my best helper in the church. Wow. He's been faithful. And now he runs a thing called Next Chapter to help people get through their addiction. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, after going through all that and see our, our city is now going through this thing where they uh, made it illegal to uh, convert somebody that is trans, for example. You, it's uh, what conversion therapy, they call it. So I got on, uh, I was quoted in the paper, I said, I'm in the business of conversion therapy. <laughs> I said, it's the only thing that sets people free. I've got friends that have been set free. First Corinthians 6 says, you've had these fornication, adulterers, homosexuals, etc. He said, and such were some of you. Mm. Past tense, but now you've been washed, but now you've been cleansed. Mm. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Passion, presence, purity. It said, be a house of prayer. My temple is a house of prayer. 
then it says here, then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. So, this temple is a house of power. It's not just pure, it's not just passion and presence and prayer. It, uh, he says, I want this temple to be a house of power. So when they received the power, right after Pentecost, Peter, it says in John, we're going to the temple, and they see a guy at the gate, beautiful. And he's asking for alms. Please give me some money. Um, do you have a lot of vagrants around here asking for money? Or I don't know. We do uh, in our area. It's kind of cold for too many homeless. Yeah, yeah. For staying, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a whole park that's set aside now for them. And, uh, but we have, I, I know a, a relative, my second cousin's son, that's all he does for a living now. It's sad, okay? Well, this one did it just to survive because he was an invalid. Peter says, I don't have any silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. Mm -hmm. Bam, grab my hand, rise up and walk, boom says he went walking and leaping and praising God and he preached the message and then after the message says repent and give your lives over to the Lord okay so uh, Peter in the temple at that time which was but now the temple is right here mm -hmm. he says hey this place is going to be a house of power mm -hmm. and he released the power to this man that was suffering hallelujah Okay, and then it says, The blind and lame came to him in the temple. He healed them when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what they are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read out of the mouths of babes and infants and nursing infants? You have perfected praise. Here's the last P I want to give you today. That it needs to be a house of praise. That your life, your temple, needs to be a house of praise. Okay? So you've got the passion. You want the presence of God in your life. You want prayer. You want the power of God. But ultimately, everything needs to be about giving glory to God in every situation. Even difficult situations, I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I just give you glory. There's a lot of ways to praise God. There's Hebrew words for it. Some of it's to raise hands. Sometimes it's praise in the Old Testament means to kneel down. One of them is to lay prostrate before the Lord. Another one is to dance. That's one way that we praise God. Also, uh, there's one that means to act glamorously foolish before the Lord. So the, that that I, I said, you ever been to? If you ever been to a Green Bay Packer football game, you see people acting glamorously foolish. Okay, and we were crazy too. We went to the the playoffs last year. I I, I bought my boys tickets to the playoffs, and they, it was against the 49ers, and obviously they shouldn't have lost, but. Uh, we all had yellow, I had yellow hair on, we all had our green and gold on, and it was cold weather. It was four crazy guys out there in the middle of cold weather getting excited about the Packers. And you know what, here's the unique thing. Not one person around us sat down that whole game. We we're all standing that whole game. All to give praise to the Green Bay Packers who lost anyway. Okay? We were acting clamorously foolish. But listen, how many who who deserves more praise than God Himself? And one of the purposes of our temple is to give praise to God continuously. Psalms 145 through 150 talks about praising God. Give giving thanks, it says in Philippians. Okay? Yeah. Give thanks in everything. So we should be going around giving praise. I always say, Christians, 
need to get the sour look off their face and start smiling a little bit and showing the light of Jesus. It makes you healthier, actually. When you smile, it releases endorphins into your body, which builds your immune system so that you can stay healthy. Why? Because God doesn't want sour pusses. He wants people that are praising. <laughs> yes. So when you greet people here at the a restaurant, smile. Amen. Your biggest light. Here, here's a testimony for you. When I, I used to walk a couple miles to school every day, uphill in the snow. No, I'm just kidding. But it was two miles. Um, but every day almost, it was from, I, I'd always read the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good work. So I'd say, Lord, help my light to shine today. Mm. And Lord, help me to smile. Because to me, the smile, the pleasantry, is the thing that people notice first about you, your countenance. Mm. And if you're always dull and angry and frustrated and everything else, people notice that too. Yeah. Greet them with a smile and everything goes a lot better. Mm. You know, if I just smile when I'm preaching, people receive a lot more. Uh. Yeah. It's just a practical thing that we can do. Start smiling. In your temple, let the light of Jesus show. Okay? It's And I always tell jokes, too. So, yeah, you hear about the blonde lady at the pearly gates. Yeah. She was there, and Peter says, you know, in order for you to get into heaven, you're going to have to pass a test. And he says, uh, how many days of the week start with T? She says, oh, that's easy. Here's four. Well, how do you get four? She says, well, there's Tuesday. There's Thursday, and there's today, and there's tomorrow. <laughs> Peter said, I'm going to have to ask you another question. How many seconds are there in a year? Oh, that's easy. She said, there's 12. Well, how do you get 12? He said, well, there's January 2nd, February 2nd, March 2nd. Oh, well, you're going to have to know this one to get in. For sure. What is the Son of God's name? Oh, that's easy, too. It's Andy. Well, how do you get Andy? She says, well, haven't you ever heard the song? Andy walks with me. Andy talks with me. <laughs> I'd say that was it. So people will remember my name. Um, so let's, let's rehearse all this again. Uh, when Jesus went into the temple, he was passionate. Okay. Zealous. Peace. He was also talking about purity. He drove out everything that didn't belong. Okay? It was all about the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord is important in our life. He said the number one priority of this temple is prayer. It should be a house of prayer. Okay? Then as they prayed and as he you know, commanded, power was released. And as a result of all of it, people began to praise God. Okay, listen, we need to do that every day in our life. We need to be walking in that presence, power, purity. Amen. And in praise. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you that you're making our temple the temple of the most holy God. Amen. We pray that we would guard our gates. And Lord God, we would only allow things in that would bring praise to your name. Mm. We pray that we'd be pure and holy. We pray that we'd be full of power. And Lord, most of all, people would sense the presence of God upon our lives. We thank mm -hmm. you for it. In Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. God.